The following is a paid advertisement. The views expressed are the sole responsibility of the advertiser. Put the power back in your hands. This is Behind the Law with attorney Justin Clark. Welcome to Behind the Law. Happy weekend to you. I have a great show lined up. You will not want to miss a single minute. And, and by the way, if you have any questions whatsoever, the phone number will be on the screen during the entire program. It is 321-282-1055. We're here to answer any questions you have. Free legal advice. It doesn't get much better than that. As always, welcome in my beautiful co-host, Michaela Nichols. Hello, Michaela. How are you? Great. Here's what we're going to do today. First of all, it's like you must watch television today because we're going to start with Raj and Joshi talking about DUI. The question is, age-old question, to blow or not to blow, that is the question. Also, during the second part of the show, we're going to talk to a couple chiropractors about what do you do after an accident, when do you get chiropractic care, is it safe, and can kids get chiropractic care? Are you ready? I am. Here's what I'd like to do. Let's take a very quick break. When we return, Behind the Law continues. Managing your investment property is as easy as one, two, three. One, sign up at GoRent123.com. Two, let Greater Orlando Realty handle everything for you when it comes to managing your property, from qualifying tenants to collecting rent, processing maintenance requests, and everything in between. Three, sit back, relax, and count all that money you're making. Earning passive income on your property is as easy as one, two, three with Greater Orlando Realty. Visit GoRent123.com today. Welcome back to the show, and a happy Labor Day weekend, by the way. Great holiday, Labor Day. You get Mondays off, but here's what we see. There's an increase in DUIs during all these holiday weekends, and what do you do if you find yourself in that position? You've had one drink at a party, a Labor Day party at your friend's house, a pool party. One drink, you get pulled over because you're speeding, you ran a stop sign, whatever it is, and they ask you to blow. The question today is to blow or not to blow that is the question. Rajan Joshi is here. Rajan, welcome. How are you, buddy? Thank you. Doing good. Thank it, you. This must be an uncomfortable question for you a little bit because <laughs> it's it, one you get a lot, but it's like, you know, how do you answer that? Because the obvious answer is don't drink and drive. But inevitably, it, uh, you know, during holidays especially, some people are going to have some alcoholic beverages and they are going to drive. We don't recommend it, obviously. Mm -hmm. We're sitting here saying we don't recommend it at all. But you get pulled over. You, you know what? Michaela wants to ask this question. She already yelled at <laughs> I, me before. So I have. So I want you to ask My the question. My one question. Okay, hypothetically, if I had literally one drink. Hypothetically? No, like, uh -huh. no, seriously, like one okay. drink, okay. like honest engine. We'll go with a hypothetical. Okay, Fine. well, anyway, okay. one drink, and I get pulled over, and I'm like, they can obviously smell something. Like, should I? Well, um, one drink, most people will be okay. Um, you know, the, the bodies. Um, it depends on what type of drink it is. I mean, if it's like a huge, uh, you know, you know <laughs> like beer. Like a standard drink. Like a standard drink, you should be okay. Um, and there's a lot of factors. It depends on your tolerance. It depends on how much you ate. Um, it depends on how quick you, you consume the drink. But one drink, usually a person is going to be okay. One or two drinks. Um, past that point, it depends. You know, then you're getting closer and closer to that .08 legal limit. And, you know, that then 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 it becomes the um, the the question do you blow or not blow um, in 22 years of doing DUIs uh, along with many other type of cases but uh, you know being a former prosecutor and as a defense attorney the cases I have found the hardest for the prosecutor to prosecute are the cases where a person does not do the field sobriety exercises um, does not blow and does not talk about how much they had to drink. The less you give, the less they got. And the more defensible the case is. Now, I'm not advocating, you know, drink and drive and, and you know, uh, uh, not blow or not cooperate, but I'm just saying, you know, objectively, those are the cases hardest to prove. How does it work, actually? When you get pulled over, uh, do they, they make you get out of the car and say your alphabet backwards, walk in a straight line? Like, what is the first thing that happens once you get pulled over and they sus are suspicious that you might have been drinking? Well, when an officer pulls someone over, you know, they look for these, these, uh, telltale signs, you know, uh, an odor of an alcoholic beverage. And let me say this, from an odor alone, you can't tell what a person drank, <clears throat> how much a person drank, or if a person drank uh, at all, is, 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 is consumed, it has any, uh, consumed any alcohol. Uh, hypothetically, if I take a, a sip of a beer, chug it down, and spit it out, you know, I might have 
you know, residual odor, but I have no alcohol in my system. Then they'll look at your eyes. You know, are they bloodshot, watery, glazy? And from that, you know, from bloodshot, watery eyes, there could be many reasons. A person could be fatigued, could mm -hmm. be depressed, could have been, you know, swimming in a pool, um, you know, been around smoke. So that alone is not a reason. Then they look at the speech. Um, how they talked, um, and you know, w really, what I attack the police officers is, you know, they don't know how the person normally talks and stuff. Um, but once they get those telltale signs, they will then conduct a DUI investigation, and they'll look at the driving pattern as well, and then they will um, ask the person to perform those field sobriety exercises, which you know, uh, there are some standard exercises like a walk and turn, standing on one leg for 30 seconds, um, finger to nose, and they'll do what's called a horizontal gauge nystagmus, which is a pen test, uh, checking how your eyes respond. And uh, my, my suggestion is never do those exercises. It's a better indication of how a person would perform on a circus than how, <laughs> how they drive. And what the police are looking for is they're looking for that person to make a mistake. They're looking for the person not to touch heel to toe. They're looking for the person to um, sway uh, a little bit. And then that's what they're gonna note on their report. Mm. This person had this sign, this sign. They could do 10 things right. The one thing they do wrong, they, they mark it down. So can I say no to the field sobriety exercises? And if I don't, how can they be used against me in court later? You can absolutely, and as a criminal defense attorney, I would suggest to uh, refuse to do them, even if you haven't been drinking, because, or even if you're not impaired at all, because, you know, there could be many reasons why. They are throwing a ton of information on a person and expecting them to do it 100% right. And if you miss any of the instructions, they're gonna count it against you on their report. At trial, they're going to tell the jury, oh, based on my training and experience, this proves the person was impaired. You absolutely have a right to refuse it. The um, consequences are the officer is going to say, at trial, if it goes that far, he refused to do the exercise. So that must mean he's impaired. Uh, I imagine that you've seen many cases that actually go to trial on DUI where that's the big piece of evidence against someone because they can't stand on two toes and pirouette or whatever. I can't do that anything. Uh, I anyway. can't either. <laughs> I mean, I can shoot three pointers, but I can't do a little dance move. I don't do ballet. It, it, it is, that is the, the tool they use because um, objectively, you know, we can attack, you know, the odor, the, um, you know the the um, the speech, the eyes, but they will they will magnify how this sure. person did these exercises wrong, and there could be many reasons why the person did it wrong. So whether I don't participate in the field sobriety exercises or I do, and they say I fail, what happens from that point forward? Usually, at the point where they're asking you to perform the field yeah. sobriety exercise, they have already made their decision. And they will say, I want to see how you perform because yeah. uh, I want to see if you're okay to drive. No, they want to get the evidence to back up their decision to make an arrest. Then they will make the arrest almost nine times out of 10, 9.9 .9 yeah. times out of 10. They will take the person to a DUI center um, and then they will request a, um, a sample of uh, the breath. Got it. So how does that work? So they, they're going to put me in the back of the cruiser and take me downtown, and, yeah. and there's literally like this this uh, a drunk place where they make you blow in something. Uh, what, what is it like? They they take them there. They um, they have them sit for 20 minutes. They ob observe them, and you know they will request um, them to perform a, a, a breath test. And you know they will tell them that if you refuse to blow, it'll be used against you in court, and your license will be suspended mm -hmm. for a year if it's your first time, or 18 months if you've refused before. But they won't tell them if you do blow over a .08, your license is going to be suspended anyways for six months, and it will definitely be used against you in court. Yeah. yeah so you know they they kind of um, strong arm the person into blowing and a lot of times people feel like they have to I mean there are legal consequences for not blowing uh, I will say that and that is a decision that person has to make if they're willing to to take those legal consequences and those consequences if I don't blow which I have every right to not blow that's correct yes. what are the consequences the consequences are um, the license will be suspended uh, for a year usually if, if it's your first DUI you can apply for a hardship you can attack the suspension in an administrative hearing. Um, but if you've refused before, mm -hmm. this is where it gets tricky. If you've ever refused before, I probably wouldn't suggest you refuse again uh, because the second refusal 
is a crime itself. It's a first degree misdemeanor, punishable up to a year in jail. And if you've refused before and they can prove that prior refusal, it's also an 18 month suspension. But if I do blow and I go 0.09, I mean, that is gonna be evidence against me at a trial if we go to trial and that's very hard to refute, I presume. Well, if it's, if it's minimally over the legal limit, then the question becomes, you know, how I'll always attack the accuracy of the machine, mm -hmm. um, the instrument that is being used, and then also they have got to prove you are at or above the legal limit at the time you were driving. So hypothetically, if it's .09 and I took like six shots and I'm driving, yeah. at that point, you know, they may pull me over and it hasn't actually, my, my, my the, the alcohol hasn't metabolized in my blood system and I may be under a .08. So that's, that's right. how you attack that. And I think it's important that uh, I speak directly to you about this because think about it. Your first DUI, is it a slap on the wrist? pretty much a slap on the wrist. But let me tell you something, I've talked to a lot of people who are at DUI number two. When you hit DUI, DUI number two or three, this is not a slap on the wrist anymore. And that's why you need to fight DUI number one. And here's how you do so. You call Raj and Joshi today. The phone number's right here on the screen. He will talk to you directly after the show, 321-282-1055. Right, Raj, and the first one, it's, it's more than a slap on the wrist, but it's not horrible, it's not, super life changing for someone. But if that's not right, if you shouldn't have been charged with the first DUI, but you're like, you know what, I don't want to fight it. I don't want to spend the money on a lawyer. That second one gets pretty bad. Yeah, the second one within five years carries a mandatory uh, 10 days in jail. If it um, if it's three within 10 of the last two, it's uh, a felony and it's uh, mandatory 30 days in jail. And a first time DUI does have some serious consequences. It does have up to six months um, in jail. It does have um, a license revocation of six months. It does have, um, you know, uh, mandatory community service hours. And it, it can be an expensive ordeal with the fines, the, the DUI classes, um, and, and all, all the hardships that it presents. And then you're right, you know, next time it gets even worse. And so it's, it's important to, to fight the DUI because uh, a lot of times if you just go in there and you enter a plea and you don't look at, at the case itself, you don't look at why the police officer stopped the person. Yeah. I've gotten some of the worst DUIs thrown out because th it was an illegal stop or it was an illegal detention or we've gotten the breath results uh, thrown out because the, the breath uh, um, um, machine was uh, was done improperly. So there's there's many things to look at and, and you know I urge people not just to give in to feel like I got arrested, I, I've been charged and that is it. it is far from it, I'll say. Or when the state sees you on the other side and they start seeing you attacking their evidence pre-trial in the months before trial, they see Raj and Joshi's name, they see that you're fighting them, a lot of times it becomes easier for the state to say, okay, we'll call this reckless driving. Exactly, because um, when you're gonna negotiate, you wanna negotiate from position of strength, not weakness. And you want to um, make sure the state knows that you're coming from position of strength when you're going to them and you break down the case and you let them know, hey, look, we will take a reckless, that's you know, right. or we'll take it to trial. Yeah. And a lot of times that's where the negotiations happen is sure. when, when you attack their evidence. Raj and Joe, she is always, uh, what a pleasure, doing Thank a great you. job for the people of Central Florida. Uh, and again, we don't want anyone drinking and driving. Of course, we don't want you drinking and driving. We want you to have an amazing Labor Day. We do, but it's easier to call an Uber. But if for whatever reason you have been charged with a DUI, I'll connect you with Rajan right now. Again, the phone number is 321-282-1055. It's a little hot in here. When we get back, we're going to talk to one chiropractor in here. Then we're going to go outside where it's a little bit cooler as behind the law continues. Does credit card debt have you spinning out of control? You are not helpless at Attorneys Justin Clark and Associates. Our goal is to lower or even eliminate your credit card debt. Call me today or visit youhavepower.com and take back control of your financial life. Is student loan debt holding you back? I'm attorney Justin Clark. You may have the power to lower or even eliminate the payments that have you living paycheck to paycheck. Call me now for a free consultation or visit youhavepower.com and take back control of your life. So you've been injured. It was an automobile accident and you didn't feel pain for a few days and all of a sudden something is, is bothering you. How long do you have to report that accident to your insurance company? It's a great question. When it comes to medically, there is a defined amount of time that you have 
uh, to report that action or, or really seek medical treatment. And let's ask our very good friend, Dr. Yanina Janeos here, of Spine and Rehabilitation Centers. Hi, Doc, how are you? Good, thank well, you for having me. You got it, my pleasure. What is the rule on this? How long do I have to seek medical treatment? So state of Florida has changed. In the past, it didn't matter, okay. um, but most recently it's 14 days. 14 days, and if I don't go seek medical treatment in that 14 days, what happens? That's it. Yeah. Your insurance won't cover your expenses. You'll kind of have to figure it out on your own. Right. So your your PIP will not kick in. So you're going to have to go against the other driver for negligence. Your your PIP is not going to cover your it. Your PIP. You got great question. <laughs> PIP. What is PIP? PIP is your in, your insurance will pay for your medical expenses in the event that you get into a car accident. Got it. Your major medical insurance, your health insurance, will not cover your expenses as a result of a car accident, because that's what you have auto insurance for. And you know, over the last couple of years, we had a lot of trouble with people who could not go see a doctor within 14 days because we were mid-pandemic, the doctor wasn't open, or maybe they were sick and they were quarantining. You created an amazing program to circumvent that. Yeah, what we're doing now is we see patients uh, via telehealth. So kind of like what you were saying, sometimes you're not in excruciating pain immediately or any type of discomfort. You need some time to figure it out. Let's see if it settles out on its own. However, you only have 14 days to be seen. And it's not 14 business days, yeah. to clarify. It's <laughs> 14 calendar days. Um, so what we've been able to do, like you had mentioned with the pandemic as well, unfortunately, if you um, have COVID, we cannot see you in the office. So we make it more accessible. Um, you call the office, schedule an appointment, and the doctor will give you a call personally to be able to answer all of your questions, um, send out for a referral if needed. How do I know it's time to, uh, to go get an MRI or go see an actual surgeon? Because a lot of people have soft tissue pain. You know, as you get older, especially, I'm witness to that. You start to feel parts of your body you didn't know really were in existence, but when do you know when you're treating someone after an accident, when it's time to send them out for an MRI or time to send them out to an ortho? So whenever a patient um, plateaus, right? If you are seeking care, you feel like you're not getting better, you have to find what's happening. Scheduling out an MRI, being seen by an orthopedist. Reality is that a chiropractor ends up being your primary care physician. Yeah. Um, regarding an accident, right? We quarterback everything. Hey, you're not getting better. Let's send out for the MRI. MRI came back saying X, Y, Z. So let's send it out to a neurosurgeon, to an orthopedist. Um, lots of people don't even realize this, but patients have anxiety after an accident. Sure. They're waking up with nightmares because they're in pain. Well, we'll send you out to a psychiatrist that you could speak to. And I think that's very important. It does become a, a mentally traumatic event as well. Four locations now. We're about to open a fourth, I heard. Yes, it's exciting. We have three, and we're opening up our uh, fourth location um, end of the month. Wow. And so four locations it makes it really easy for your, uh, your patients because you really have all of Central Florida covered at this point. And it becomes difficult when you do have an accident. Sometimes you don't have time to drive far away to get that medical treatment. Correct. And what you guys have done is uh, is pretty amazing. What separates you from some of the other places? I like to say it's patient care. Um, we genuinely focus on making sure that the patient is getting better and that we are doing, well, kind of what your segment is called, behind the, behind the law, right? Yeah. Making sure that we're covering the patient's care through beginning to end and that they're getting everything that they need. So when their attorney decides to pursue legal matters, everything is written down. How long before, how long will you try the conservative approach before you'll send someone out generally? Is there, is there a rule of thumb on this or not? Um, there is, there is six weeks at most um, three weeks is kind of generally what I try to do. Six visits. Yeah. Conservative treatment. If it's not getting better, let's go head out and send out for an MRI. When I do have an accident and I am starting with you, my quarterback, my chiropractor, how many times a week do I need to go normally? Everybody's different. Okay. Right. Um, this week alone, I had a lady that has numbness in the side of her face. We had to send her out immediately uh, for images. Um, but usually about three times a week, and then everything starts to taper off after those three, four weeks. You keep up the good work, Dr. Yanina Janeo. You guys are awesome, by the way. I hear such good things about you. Uh, please do keep it up and, and congrats on that fourth location. Thank you. Spine and Rehabilitation Centers, if you had an accident, give them a call right now. They will not disappoint. Now back out to our studio in the nature. 
That's our We Hope It's Fall Soon studio. <laughs> Chiropractic care is not just for you adults. It's not just for those of you that have been injured at an accident. It can really be helpful to an entire family. I wanted to ask Dr. Elian Santos about this because it's, and welcome in doc, how are you? Thank you, good. Chiropractic care everyone thinks is only if you've been injured or uh, if you're an adult. You have a pediatric department as well. You treat entire yes. families. Tell yes. me when chiropractic care can be good for our children. Absolutely. I think when people understand the physiology of how our body works and our nervous system works, we will be more eager to get our babies checked as soon as they're born. Uh, when they go through the birthing process, it could be very traumatic to the spinal nervous system. So either during pregnancy or that birthing process, the way they, they're born can be so traumatic to their spinal nervous system, really? specifically C1, C2 area, and that controls so much in babies. So when you see babies dealing with colics, reflux, problem breastfeeding, sleeping, that's when we can help them a lot. So we're talking about not just children, we're talking about babies. Yes. Yes, wow. exactly. Like for myself, I had my babies and as soon as they were born, when I was ready, I checked them because it's so important for them to live a life free of subluxations. Now that term subluxation is when a bone is out of alignment, putting pressure over nerve, causing dysfunction. So for example, my, my girl, she was born with a cord around her neck and I mm. noticed she preferred to look to one side more than the other. She was tight, she was tense. So as soon as I adjust her, I saw her release and looking both ways. Well, let's say I'm watching at home right Right now, and I have mm -hmm. had a child recently, yeah. maybe a one year old, a six month old. Yeah. Would you recommend, and at what age would you recommend that I actually take them to see you just to make sure everything's okay? I would say as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, if they're dealing with stuff, typically at six months, they are starting to sit down. So if you're noticing they're not hitting the milestones, if you're noticing they're always um, grumpy or crying too much, they're not taking their naps, they're not relaxing and doing what they're supposed to do, there are three main things babies are supposed to do, right? They eat, they sleep, and they poop. <laughs> if they're not doing that. I thought that's what adults right? <laughs> Us too. Okay. It's just the vital <laughs> stuff, right? If they're not doing that, they need to get checked. Now, many parents are scared to take their babies yeah. to the chiropractor mm -hmm. because I typically hear, I saw this video on TikTok, please don't do that. It's scary. Sure. Uh, it's so gentle on babies. It's just a uh, sustained pressure on their spine and that is all they need. I think everyone knows when they have a baby, they need to take their baby to the pediatrician. Yes. Oh, we have a new pediatrician. We yes. love them. Yes. It was recommended by the doctor who uh, delivered the baby. Yeah. How do do you and what you do with children coexist with pediatricians? Do, do you clash with them? Do you get along with some of them? How is that relationship? It all depends. It all depends. Some pediatricians, they're so up to refer um, doc, patients to the chiropractor and they are willing to um, work with us. Some car some doctors, they don't. So it all depends. And we thrive in educating our patients. So typically when we see a, a baby coming from the pediatric doctor, it's because they have ear infections or they get sick often or, or they're not um, digesting well. So we try to teach the parents a lot how the nervous system works. Right. And typically, if the baby is on a fight or flight state or rex and digest state, we teach them their two system, the autonomic system. And typically, these kids are in a fight or flight state. And because they're like that, it's like a tiger chasing you all the time. Even though you're just sitting relaxed, your nervous system is in that state. So the baby cannot relax, cannot do well. So we teach the wow. parents, this is why you need to get them checked. I had no idea. I mean, right. this is amazing information. It's why we do this show, really. Yeah. Now, let's get a little bit later in life. Let's say exactly. that I have a 12-year-old heading into middle school, I guess, at that point. Mm -hmm. They play sports and just feeling some exactly. nagging back pain. Exactly. How do I know it's time to take my 10, 12-year-old to see you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what happens is if we don't take our babies to the chiropractor when they're babies, we typically see these teenagers dealing with a lot of stuff, more chronic stuff. So they start with the back pain, complaining at when they're sitting, when they're carrying the backpacks, they're, they're having that back pain. But also they cannot focus on school well. Right. They have anxiety, they're dealing with depression, they're constipated. And we teach the parent everything happens, probably in the birthing process or prenatal. Right. And then we teach them how the body functions, how the, your spine functions. and we teach the parents to get them adjusted as soon as possible. Truly family chiropractic yes. care. Amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing what you're doing. Keep up the good work, Doc. Thank you. We hope Thank to you. see you again here soon. If you have any questions about chiropractic care, 321-282-1055. I'll literally connect you with her right now, R right after the show. I'd be happy to do so. What did we learn is up next.
Our good buddy Greg Mann is here, a property manager, uh, the best in the business, I assure you, Greg. How are you, sir? Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It scares me a little bit because there are some people still out there who own real estate, who rent it out, and they want to do it themselves. I never advise that whatsoever because, and you've seen it, Greg, people who rent houses out to someone else and decide they want to do self-help evictions, they can get in trouble legally for that. Yeah, well, first of all, they're not professionals, so they don't know what they're doing. And as you would know better than most people, if you don't know what you're doing and you're not a professional, don't do it. Um, so avoid it. Or if you if you self-manage and you need to do an eviction, go to an attorney. Even that aside, though, anyone who owns real estate that they're renting out really should have a property manager such as yourself. What are all the things that you do to make life easier for me, the landlord? From start to finish, we rent the house out. We collect the rent. We send it to you. We maintain the house. Everything's just one package, it's simple. It is, and vendors, you know so many vendors, you make life easier for me, the landlord, because you have those connections already. We do, and, and but we, we actually really screen our vendors really well. You know, so every vendor that works with us, licensed and insured, um, and we turn vendors down left, right, and center, but you know, we're always looking for good vendors too. And wouldn't you say, some people say, I'm gonna rent it myself because I don't wanna pay Greg, I don't wanna pay a property manager, but wouldn't you say you actually save the landlord money over oh. time because of your relationship with these vendors? Absolutely, we save money. Not only do we save money with the vendors, we save time, which is which you can never get back. And uh, 2 a.m. phone calls, I'm not getting those. No, you won't, I get those. Literally, as the property owner, I just buy the property and turn everything over to you and collect checks. I don't have to do anything. Yeah, it's like winning the lottery every single day. Uh, if, you, uh, if you own real, thank you, Greg, as always, we always appreciate your insight. If you own real estate that you're renting out and you're handling it yourself, it's not a good idea. You can get yourself into trouble and it's gonna cost you money. Call Greg Mann today. More behind the law is just ahead. Managing your investment property is as easy as one, two, three. One, sign up at GoRent123.com. Two, let Greater Orlando Realty handle all of the management of your property. Three, sit back and count your money. Visit GoRent123.com today. We'll wrap up behind the law here, send you to an awesome long weekend, but we must do. What did we learn? Michaela, what did you learn today? I learned it's never too early to have your back with that, you know, even if you're a baby. I guess so. I was a little <laughs> surprised by that too, that uh, chiropractic care for, for small children, I didn't know that was such a thing. Apparently mm -hmm. it can be a good thing for your young yeah. kids. Uh, what about DUIs, blow or not blow? Just don't drink and drive. Don't drink and don't drive. Don't drink and drive. <laughs> but let's say that you have had a couple of drinks. Do you blow or do you not blow? You just don't blow, ever. Period. Don't blow over. And, and I think that, yes, there can be some, some consequences to that. If you don't blow, if you get taken downtown, they're going to take your license away for a year, but you can apply for a hardship. But that, that evidence is used against you if you do blow or if you do those field sobriety tests. Yeah, I mean, an Uber is cheaper than a DUI, Uber right? Uber is always cheaper. Michaela, as always, you did a fantastic job today. Thank you for being here. Of course. And as always, thank you for joining us every single weekend here on Behind the Law. Special thanks to our crew here. Amazing crew here. We'll see you next week for more Behind the Law. Having debt can leave you feeling helpless. I'm attorney Justin Clark. Filing for bankruptcy may give you the power to lower or even eliminate the payments that have you living paycheck to paycheck. Call me now for a free consultation or visit youhavepower.com and take back control of your life. The proceeding was a paid advertisement. The views expressed were the sole responsibility of the advertiser.